So Francis Bacon was one of the great followers of Montaigne. He was, in, in essence, the English Montaigne, in that he wrote uh, primarily uh, essays in the essay form, where he was tracking his thoughts on various questions of the day and recording them as a philosophical uh, exercise. And you can see in them uh, a lot of Montaigne's uh, technique of recording these, these circuits of thought that go on, a, a real effort in the, uh, in the Renaissance vein of tracking the workings of the human mind. With Bacon, it's a little bit more ends-oriented, I would say. You get a bit more of the, uh, well, yes, this is how I reach my conclusion. But the conclusion is always much more firm, I would say, than Montaigne ever had. Montaigne was really more about the, the process of thought and uh, more often than not, Bacon's got the product in mind. The, uh, the, he covers a wide variety of topics, and he's a really interesting character. But one of the more interesting ones that I find, is one of the more significant uh, uh, topics, was, uh, was when he explored in his very short, a lot of his essays were very short, really more like just little blog entries, quite frankly, uh, of marriage and single life. Now, this topic is uh, of some biographical interest for a lot of people who have a prurient interest in Sir Francis Bacon. He is a very colorful character, of course. And there's, uh, to this day, some rampant curiosity about his sexuality, whether or not he was, uh, uh, he, he was married, but there's a lot of speculation as to his, uh, his, his homosexual uh, activities, uh, extramarital activities, or before marriage, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, have whatever you want from that. But the topic as it is explored in this essay is really quite interesting because, again, he starts it, he goes into it as a kind of empirical problem, as he seemed to approach everything, where he is going to weigh the pros and the cons of whether or not men should marry. Uh, he is approaching this very much from the male point of view. He's not engaging really with, well, you know, what, what does it matter what, what women might want or what would be best for them? He is approaching it from a very uh, single frame of reference. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, but he is then engaging from there in a kind of study of it, an empirical consideration of the process, a trying out of the thought, as an essay is literally supposed to be. And so he does engage in that. But again, you always feel like, you know, there, there's a thumb on the scale. He knows where he's going to get with this. And his attitude is not hard to read from uh, throughout. Uh, I mean, the very first line, uh, he that hath wife and children hath given hostages to fortune. <laughs> Hostages to Fortune is a interesting little locution that survives to this day. He had a knack for uh, phrase making, as uh, as some might say. But uh, you see in that, like, okay, automatically he is saying uh, a man who gets married is automatically kind of behind the eight ball, as to use another uh, locution, not his. But uh, you get that sense of he's already got an opinion on this and now he's just going to explore it. And that itself is a interesting uh, uh, intellectual pose where he is engaging his own uh, preferences, his own um, uh, prejudices, if you will, and willing to explore them from a empirical standpoint. Say, well, okay, what do I think? Uh, uh, what do I know in the Montaigne construction and try and find a, uh, a justification for that or a, uh, or to test it in one way or the other. This is very much the Renaissance man playing out. Uh, but there is again, that sense that, well, he kind of 
he knows where he's going to end up. And the, uh, the opinion that he starts to unfold is that uh, single men are more free. Single men have, uh, have, have a much greater uh, possibility for achievement. Uh, certainly the best works and of the greatest merit for the public have proceeded from the unmarried or childless men, which both in affection and means have married or endowed the public. Uh, he's saying that, well, you know, when you have kids, that takes up an awful lot of your enemy or when you have uh, energy or when you have, uh, uh, when you have a wife, that's something else you have to attend to. And you get this image of him as somebody not hard to, uh, imagine who is really smart and enjoys being smart. But the problem with uh, domestic life is that it often calls on you to be less engaged with those topics that challenge and engage you and more about like, well, you know, why are you such a slob? Uh, that is the construction he's uh, he's building here. Uh, there is no sense that a wife could be a, uh, you know, a, uh, a helpmate in this endeavor. There's no sense that, well, a wife is going to, uh, um, you know, uh, challenge him to think in different ways or expose him to different ideas. That's not coming into it at all. The case he lays out is that, well, you know, some people do better, but most people don't um, with uh, with a wife. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, there are some uh, there are some foolish, rich, covetous men that take pride in having no children because they may be thought to be so much the richer, which is just purely engaging with the, uh, with the valuation of women are an impediment. The, um, uh, the single lot doth well with churchmen for charity will hardly water the ground where it must fill a pool. So... Uh, priests, or uh, in his moment, reverends, are uh, doing better without women. He writes, wives are young men's mistresses, companions for middle age, and old men's nurses. Again, the reference here has nothing to do with the women and all about what they can do for the man. There's no question of, uh, of affection or, or certainly equality in any sense. It's clearly just a, a, ser a servant's role that he's looking to fill, but it's very objective in the way he's going about it. And he then uh, he even leans back and quotes a, uh, a uh, an ancient Greek, uh, but yet he was reputed one of the wise men that made answer to the question when a man should marry, quote, a young man not yet, an elder man not at all. That's a uh, sixth century BC Greek uh, uh, saying, but here you can see this very pragmatic view of marriage and uh, a, a very dispassionate and intellectualized view of it. It is simply something to calculate and, well, how can I do what is best for me? You can see in this, I think, uh, the, the Renaissance tradition of thinking your way through something, of using your reason and not approaching things emotionally. Now, certainly he was addressing a, uh, a largely aristocratic and royal crowd. Uh, if not that, then also you could also probably add a, an upper, a, a rising middle class merchant crowd. On all of these levels, uh, marriage is not an emotional connection. Marriage is primarily a financial or political connection. The idea of uh, a royal uh, marrying for love is almost absurd. Um, they marry to create alliances with, uh, with other countries or other, uh, other, other segments of their own population. And they, you know, they can indulge in love matters, uh, outside the marriage. That's what marriage is all about. It's just the institution. And certainly he was writing, uh, he was, uh, Bacon was famously a counselor to James the first and the whole house of Stuart. 
and you know James the first has his own issues with uh, with marriage and women in general so he, he, this is a calculated approach this is what he is advocating this is what Bacon is advocating and you can see in this that Renaissance tradition of analysis um, of the use of reason but also again in in the way that he seems to have already concluded uh the uh the, the 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 inquest before it's begun the way he is uh leaning down on uh one side of the question with so much assurance uh the idea that marriage take it or leave it uh but if so do it strategically not when you're young kind of pointless when you're old but sure it's handy to have somebody there as a drool nurse uh, but it is exclusively for someone in middle age. If you're over 40, you're not so impetuous. You can just, you know, you can make the best of it. You can make the most of it. You can extract the most from the relationship that it has to give that is actually productive in a way that uh, matters. And here you see that uh, somewhat cold rejection of not only yeah, not only of, uh, of uh, the emotional uh, content of marriage or the romantic content of marriage, but a, a rejection of emotion in any way, uh, a cold, clear-hearted uh, or clear-headed, uh, reasonable approach. And here Bacon is almost tipping his hand as a, a man of the future, because this is the early threads of the Enlightenment seeping in. A complete rejection of emotion, a belief in, I need to be a free functioning, untethered reason, a faculty of an intellect, uh, functioning at my highest level, and that is all that matters rejecting any emotional connection, rejecting even a humanity that can, uh, that can perhaps counterbalance that, which is really more of a Renaissance uh, notion, the idea of being split. You have uh, his, his god Montaigne was always very famously torn between the power of his reason and the pull of his physicality. Bacon is seeking to seemingly shed physicality, shed the vestiges of common humanity, and dwell in that enlightened place. Here he is ahead of his time.